are just that I want to acknowledge that, um, of course, a lot of us probably already know there's been a lot of intensity in um, the news cycle and in current events um, today and also in um, the past few weeks. And I want to say that whatever you need to do to take care of yourself in this moment, um, please feel free to do that. Uh, you know, if you need to take a break, whatever you need. Um, yeah, we're, um, we support that all the way. So I think with that said, I'm going to let um, Esperanza take it away, our facilitator. Okay. Hi, everybody. I'm Esperanza. Um, and so today, this panel is all about Korean art and how I get started. Um, there's a whole bunch of other questions that we're going to get into and talk about. So everyone will introduce themselves as like the answer question. Um, so just getting right into it, I'm going to ask a general question that everybody can each answer. Um, and first, starting off is what brought you to the arts? And what interests you in becoming a working artist in like a professional way. So anyone can start um, and introduce yourself as you do that, name and pronouns. So yes. Hi there, I'm Jen De Los Reyes. My pronouns are she, her, they, them. I always strive towards a collective we. So if we get there by the end of this panel, that would be great too. I came to the arts, I think in the way that most people do. As an art educator, I understand, especially at a university, that when someone comes to the art school pursuing a degree in fine arts, they didn't have a choice. They were so driven to it, right? Like it was a calling and I feel very similarly, something that I knew I had wanted to do for a very long time. Hi, my name is Jarius Brookins, uh, he, him pronouns. Uh, similar to uh, Jen, I think it's something that you are called to. Uh, when I chose graphic design uh, and marketing to kind of go into, uh, when I went to university, it's like, you know, you meet together with a bunch of students and you choose your major and everything was just ill to me outside of graphic design. So I had to choose that one. And, um, you know, it has just been a blessing ever since. It's something that um, I really can't see myself not doing. So, yeah. I can go next. <clears throat> Jen, did you have birds in your, in the, in the background? I do. Yeah. yeah, that was really, really soothing to hear. Um, my name is Joel uh, Mercedes. Pronouns are any pronouns that you feel like you want to use for me. Um, my name also works. Uh, I'm an artist and also an educator, mostly working with uh, um, young people of various ages. Um, this is a really interesting question because it's it feels like it changes depending on my mood <laughs> in terms of what like has a has allowed me to arrive um, to to this moment. But I think like it comes from, and I spoke to Andy a little bit about this in our studio visit, but I think it comes from like a deep inquiry uh, for me as a kid um, and just having all these questions that I felt like adults couldn't really answer. And so I think that the arts doesn't necessarily give me answers to those questions always, but it allows me to make sense of how to tackle or how to create bigger questions. Um, and so I sort of go, go to the arts to do that. And that feels like a way to kind of make through those puzzles in my head in terms of thinking about these questions that still feel very unresolved. Hi, everyone. <laughs> my name is Chelsea Stevenson, and I am a professional henna artist and business strategist. Um, I have a different experience in that I came to the arts out of necessity. Uh, my background is in social work and I launched my career actually after losing my job with, while working with a nonprofit. Um, and the arts were something that it was something that I knew how to do. And um, it's interesting for me actually even just reflecting on this question for myself. I come to this place where Today, I recognize that my art is a means to a greater end. Uh, I believe that the work that I do is one that is 
centered around legacy and around the um, creation of uh, empowering spaces for the people that I serve. And um, it's, it's, it's fun to me just as I kind of savor on this experience. And I apologize because I, I am working through, <laughs> I am working through some of the heavier things from today's um, experience or shared experience. Um, um, but what I will say is, um, as I'm kind of working through this and thinking through this for myself, I find that that my art is, um, it allows me a platform and it allows me a means to end to be able to provide soothing, soothing spaces and spaces wherein the people I serve can feel seen and can feel heard and valued, um, which ties very closely, of course, to the work that I was doing in, um, in the capacity of social work. So, um, from a, a more black and white perspective, right? I came to the arts up by means of, of financial necessity. Um, but when you look at the actual result, I think that it was a it was certainly a, a higher calling that put me into this position so that I could make the impact on the world that I was called to make, um, just perhaps not in the way that I thought that I would be doing it. So I'm excited to be here. Um, and kind of like uh, branching off of that, the aspect of like uh, making change through, or, or showing change through your art. Um, what do you think are like realities or challenges of being an artist? Because I know a lot of the times um, work is really powerful and you can use that work to like create social change and visual aspects. Because sometimes that's the only way people can see like this is how we feel about an issue. Um, and so Chelsea, you can answer this anyone else who wants to, but just what are some challenges of having that sort of responsibility of showing the need for change through your art? Ooh, that's heavy. <laughs> that's so heavy. For me, um, I think the change has to be inspired and also executed at the on the individual level right like it has to take place in small spaces before it can create a larger impact and so um, inside of my work obviously i'm creating wearable art so i'm creating art you know on my clients on my canvas and inside of that space the art itself again i'll say is is the means to the end so what happens when oftentimes when people come to visit me they're looking for something they're looking to be uh, seen or to be celebrated or to be heard and so for me the art while it's very much inspired by my wearer by you know my client the artist is simply the container for conversations, or it's the container for an exchange of energy, or it's the container for uh, for us to have hard conversations, um, and for me to be the witness of someone else's burden or the witness of someone else's celebration, perhaps. Um, there is a little bit of an added context here. Um, oftentimes, inside of my industry, um, there is there's definitely been a whitewashing of our art form. And um, not only that, but there's been like a centering of uh, South Asian culture specifically. And there's definitely been an erasure of African culture inside of the henna art uh, industry. And um, so part of my work is not only to provide space um, at the individual level, but also to re-educate and to reintroduce um, this art form that exists currently and has existed for thousands of years um, inside of our cultural community um, and reintegrating that and reintroducing that to modern, you know, descendants of enslaved people um, really feels good. And that, that also is part of the work that I do. So um, affecting change for me can, it looks it looks like a number of different things, be it that individual exchange or the larger education piece that's taking place. Um, but really, I think what it comes down to is helping people to not only identify something that is theirs, um, be it the art itself or a piece of them that come that becomes awakened by the art exchange and the art experience, um, or <laughs> simply coming in and, and realizing that, oh my goodness, I can be made to feel beautiful in this very unique way. And even beyond that, while my ancestors would have also have done this. And I don't know, there's there's a, a connection that takes place. Um, and I almost feel like we are transcending time and reclaiming something very, very beautiful and unique. So I hope that answers your question. 
I'd love to speak to that great question next. You know, my instinct at first was to say, artists don't have a heightened responsibility to change, but that is actually not true. I do believe that we are beholden in a much more intense way because there's actually data that proves that storytelling and the arts allow human beings to process difficult information more readily than say, if you were to hear about climate change and get a bunch of statistics, we don't understand or retain the information the same way as we do when it's told through a story or through art. So we do have a responsibility as artists to show other ways of being and living and connecting to one another and to show possible futures. And I think, especially when we are in this moment of crisis, we need to do that. And I didn't raise my hand on purpose. That was an accident. <laughs> no, it's all good. <laughs> um, Jarius, Joel, do any of you want to answer or the floor is yours? I think uh, for me, uh, you two kind of hit it on the head. Uh, that's pretty much my answers for that question. Okay. Um, so just as like another general question, um, just like the stories about finding your path through your art, I know there's a whole bunch of different professions you can go down regarding art. There's a lot you can do. Um, but just how did you find yourself within your art and how did you find like, oh, this is what I want to do regarding the arts? Um, and like, how did you figure what you wanted to do? <laughs> Again, go ahead and start with this. Um, I think for me, uh, I came from a place where uh, I was being pressured to uh, go to college and make these big decisions as a uh, 18, 19 year old. Um, you know, there's a joke that I hear a lot that, you know, that says like, you know, we go from having to ask to use the restroom to now figuring out the next 20 years of our lives and uh, making decisions that that's going to affect them. I think that's, that's very true. I think, um, you know, I was receiving uh, parental pressures about, you know, um, hey, make sure you go to college for something that is going to make money, because you're going to owe that money back. And then, um, you know, are you sure you want to go into the arts? And it was like, things like that, just floating in my head, along with, you know, if anyone in the audience goes to a, um, a college prep school, you know the pressures along with that. Um, everything is geared towards that. So I think I was wrestling with, uh, you know, pursuing my passions uh, and potentially living a life that, you know, someone else wanted for me. So um, when I decided on design, you know, it involved everything that I knew that I wanted to get into uh, deep into my heart. So um, I was initially a paint-based artist and um, you know, I like to draw paint. And um, I knew I had interest in technology and software, but I knew I, you know, I kind of didn't want to do um, deep web development stuff, um, but I knew I wanted to do something that involved uh, digital design. So graphic design kind of uh, held that place for me. And I didn't even know that was a possibility until I was about to mark down um, uh, undecided. And I met up with the uh, advisor for, uh, for graphic design. And he told me all about it. He gave me a pamphlet. And again, this was a pamphlet that was not provided to me, uh, but the STEM pamphlet was the, uh, um, you know, the pre-med was, but not the design and arts. So he was able to show me that. And I fell in love and I knew this is what I wanted to do. I raised my name off of the undecided list, turned it to graphic design and uh, pretty much history from there. So um, that's pretty much how I got into it. I can answer that. And so just to kind of reiterate the question is specifically how you came to the arts. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I, I would say that it it's hard to to have um, a sort of concrete answer to that because I feel like the arts were always such a big part of how I understood the world that I was like living within as a young person. But I would say that I'd, initially it was through 
kind of a love of characters and wanting to be an actor and like going to like youth theater programs um, and or or visiting museums and and being really taken by like the way art can appear on a wall or on the floor. <laughs> um, like really, I think going to like contemporary art museums that I, I think like blew, blew up my mind because I, for a while, I just didn't think that art was possible in the ways that it appears at contemporary art museums, especially like seeing things like on the floor and you having to walk around it. Um, and then sort of fast forward, I, I think for, I think initially I thought I wanted to like only do like acting or theater or be on a stage and then I realized that maybe I was limiting myself to only one kind of um, piece of art making. And so when I moved to Chicago and I attended SCIC, it was perfect in, initially because it was a school that as a hybrid interdisciplinary artist, you can kind of go there and sort of make your way. Um, but I think that like it's it's hard because I didn't have like a traditional college experience. Like I sort of had to leave because it was too much money. And then I had to like make sense of how to like continue making art, um, learning in in I, I like to say in, in a in, in DIY fashion in the sense of like how to like get resources that institutions have, but like through friends or through like um, people that still are in these are in. The, are in these institutions that are that sort of develop friendships or networks with with me while I was there, and so it, I think it's it's been kind of an interesting trial and error to like make make sense to be within the arts when money becomes a concern. But I think like to go back to kind of the the previous question that you asked in terms of this notion of like inquiry or or probably always wanting more from the world, like not being satisfied with like the status quo or the kind of um, ways that um, when I was young, the adults wanted a particular version of my existence and I just didn't want that. And so I think like the arts always feel like a space to um, that helps you demand more <laughs> sort of like for yourself, um, for those around you and sort of like larger than that. Um, if no one wants to answer it, I can move on. Okay. Okay. Um, so this is kind of like a general sense, just I feel like some everyone who talked hit on it basically, but is there anything you wish you did differently when starting? Um, also, there's a question in the chat that sort of connects to this, but do you feel like starting something new in your art world, like going from like traditional art sense to like making music or possibly like creative writing, because there's like more than one, just like visual arts. Um, but like to reiterate the question, how do you feel about starting something new from what you do now? And is there anything you would do different regarding? I'd love to answer that. So the question, you know, how do you feel about starting something new, like going from traditional art to music making? I'll say that what I do is not, I guess, considered traditional art, although there is a very long history of it. Like, you know, you can go back to the 1920s, 1916, Marcel Duchamp, things like that, or even I like to take it back to like, actually, I think cave paintings <laughs> were part of what I do in terms of social practice, community-based art, socially engaged art, right? Like cave paintings in a way were like the first mural artists, but they were also defining social space and social roles and, you know, goods and resources, all sorts of things like that. And so the kind of work that I do is often defined as social practice or socially engaged art. And what that really means is any artist that essentially works with people or the social as the medium, that the work you do, whatever the outcome is, could not happen without the power of the people that you are working with, right? And so there are artists who work in this way that change legislation. There are artists that work in this way that form mutual aid networks. There are artists who work in this way that you know work on community healing. There's a lot of ways to do this kind of work. I think often the one that people are most familiar with is like, oh, you're doing like socially based work, like people working together to paint a mural. Yes, absolutely. But also so much more. And 
So I think I wanted to really start with that because to me, like moving from traditional art to music, I was like, wait, music is one of the traditional arts, you know, but I get it in terms of being interdisciplinary and that that can feel scary. But I think, especially being at an art school and teaching, I teach one of the foundation level classes. And so often it is students who are coming in that have this very defined idea of what art is. And I love to be there right at the beginning to explode it <laughs> and just make it so that you think about what is the idea and the drive behind your work? And then what is the best medium to support communicating that idea to the world, right? And so you don't have to work in one way as an artist to tell your story. You can work in any way that best supports how you can communicate that story to others. And so I think that's a really important one. Uh, I, I'll do a two for one in terms of the question of do you sell your work? Based on what I just said, the answer is basically no. <laughs> I mean, there are artists who do this work that can find ways to monetize it. I also feel like that is, it can be problematic, especially if you're working within community. There, there are bigger questions at play, I think, ethically in terms of who gets the money? Why are you making money off of other people? You know, there's just, you can't really say unless you know the full context. Like sometimes I have sold work, like if I've made things that are more object-based or, you know, I, I work a lot in language and so often I will make books. So those are some of the ways that I do sell work. Yeah. Great. Um, sorry for that. <laughs> kind of scared me. Um, so I want to get into some of the uh, questions asked by uh, students in a bit, but there are a couple other ones I wanted to ask um, as a whole. So I know a lot of you, I've been doing research on current projects that you all have been running. Um, so if everyone wants to go around and say a current project that they've been working on um, and kind of like how this was influenced, how it started, if it's going to grow or just like, or maybe like your best project have you worked on so far and just how that came to be in general sense? <laughs> I could jump in on that, I guess. Um, so my primary project right now is uh, supporting other artists and creatives inside of a program that I run. It's called Hennepreneur Pro. And the <sighs> what inspired this project was me getting very fed up with the idea of the starving artist um, and how there's this belief that in order to be an artist, one must struggle and one must you know, face all of these uphill battles and also acknowledging the fact that our current situation is one that perpetuates that truth, right? And so um, for me, because I'm working in what one might, con might consider, you know, the ethnic arts, I'm also working in an industry that's primarily fi uh, female dominated. I'm also working, you know, inside of this industry where when you have those two dynamics, both the ethnic piece and also the gender role, what was art then becomes reduced to crafts. And <laughs> it's very, very hard for um, people to, to come into this work and be able to monetize the things properly and be able to feed their families. Um, I mentioned that, you know, when I started my work, I, I came in with this understanding that I needed to make money yesterday because I needed to pay the bills. I was a single parent. Um, and so um, I've always looked at my art and as my business and at my business, excuse me, as a business and treated it in that way. And so when I decided that I, you know, wanted to take this practice and put it into the hands of other people, I wanted to do that in a way that would also be financially empowering for them. Um, for me, that also speaks to the change that I'm wanting to see take place in the world. I find that in general artists, we tend to be more socially conscious. We're more aware of our neighbors. We are very much often driven to leave the world better than we found it. And so how, for better or for worse, right? How does one do that without having the resources available? Um, and so the premise of my program is to teach um, Henda artists how to monetize their skill set um, and other creatives that come snuck inside, but uh, how to monetize their skill set in a way that allows for them to make the money that they need to care for themselves and their families without, you know, totally sacrificing life in the process. 
Um, so that's been my biggest project right now. And my, my goal is to change some of the statistics around artists in general. When you look at, I wanna say the most recent numbers that I'd pulled showed that most artists make in the US make somewhere below $50,000 per year in annual revenue. And it's like, who can live off of that? If you're in a major city, that's not a thing, right? And so when you add into that any sort of gender disparities, if you add into that any sort of uh, conflicts around um, socioeconomic, you know, pieces as well, like it is, it is very much an uphill battle. And so my um, calling inside of this project is to teach the people that I'm teaching how to fish so that they can go out and um, use their art, not only to affect change in their own communities with those clients that they're serving one-on-one -on -one, um, and, and beyond that, but uh, also, you know, even at, at the dinner table and so forth. So that's, um, that's, that's where I'm at right now. I guess I can go next. Um, a project that I'm working on right now, um, again, I recently, uh, well not recently, but back in December, I uh, graduated college. So I've kind of had downtime, um, but in that downtime, I've been working on an apparel brand. And so something I wanted to do with this brand was, uh, you know, alongside with creating clothing to sell, I wanted to uh, take people on that process. I think. Um, a lot of times we uh, purchase clothing uh, based on the brand name, uh, but maybe not for, uh, you know, how it came about, how it's supporting your community, how it's um, trying to grow within your community. I think a lot of people don't think about that. And I kind of want to uh, break the idea that um, uh, creatives um, aren't doing hard work. Uh, so I, I do a lot of durability uh, clothing based work. And so um, I make like uh, worker jackets for creatives, for painters. Um, you know, I make sure that, you know, uh, if I'm designing a bag, there's component, there's components for uh, people who uh, work in photography so they can keep their, um, their equipment safe and things like that. So um, it's basically, um, you know, looking at the creative world and the lens of, uh, you know, the same lens you would uh, look at someone who does uh, construction or something like that too. And I, and I think this, it's a cool way to do it because um, there is this notion that, you know, people who uh, go to school for, for uh, the creative, uh, in the creative space and uh, people who, um, you know, decide to go into the arts aren't doing helpful projects in society when uh, that's, it's almost the opposite. I think uh, uh, we do a lot of projects that inspire um, uh, civil engineering, um, politics and things of that nature. So, um, you know, to speak on some of the um, realities that are going on today with uh, 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 social issues, as most of you are aware of, a lot of the social media campaigning for, to allow people to know about what's going on with the trial, allow people to understand um, just how the law works um, comes from things like uh, informational graphics or um, you know, people just uh, creating digital content that, uh, that pushed us to a place of understanding to have the success in the trial that uh, happened today. So, um, I kind of wanted to pay homage to that with uh, with this clothing brand and kind of show that hard work and pay tribute to uh, things like that. So uh, it's it's something I've been working on. I'm still in like the building stage stages of it, but um, you know I always have my website up so you can see us build as we're uh, creating this uh, working on this social project. I call it a social project more so than a clothing line because um, you know with every development you see. Um, I'm seeing it as well. Uh, you're in the driver's seat with me. So that's kind of how I think about it. So that's something I'm working on. I love that. I can't wait to see how it goes. And I want to suggest if you don't know this artist who's based in California, her name's Andrea Zatel, that you look at some of her work around garments. She runs this project called Smock Shop that kind of just reminded me of um, 
yeah, of that when you were talking about what you were doing in terms of garments for artists. So check that out. I think it could be inspirational. Um, for me, in terms of what I'm working on or most excited about, or I have a whole secret body of work <laughs> that nobody knows about <laughs> that I've been excited to, to share. So I'll share it a little bit now. It's kind of related to what I was saying earlier in terms of an artist having a, you know, a greater responsibility in terms of social issues. And one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is climate justice, environmental impacts, and thinking about birds. I'm a bird lover, I'm a bird watcher, and there are currently about 389 species of birds in North America that are in danger of extinction, and it's because of the extreme climate change. And so birds are telling a story right now that we don't feel and understand in the same way that these small changes in weather are having major impacts. And I think on so many species that you would be shocked. I mean, that number should be shocking. It is alarming, you know, to think that that many hundreds of birds, and that's only in North America, that are in danger right now of total extinction is shocking. And so there are a variety of projects I've been doing around that. One involves inviting artists to do renderings of the birds that are currently going extinct and compiling those in a sort of anti autobahn birds of North America. You know, when Autobahn did his his publication, it was it was both obsessive and beautiful, but also destructive. Like every single portrait of a bird you see in in the birds of America were killed by Autobahn. <laughs> like he was also a hunter who was collecting these to be able to do the renderings. Um, but so, yeah, so I've been working on that. And I also have a digital collection that I'm working on, which is I'm taking vintage slides from bird watchers from the 70s and 80s and digitizing them and just sort of showing like these birds that are disappearing through this now sort of extinct technology of slides in themselves. So those are some things I'm excited about. Just to piggyback on the birds, <laughs> I absolutely love birds. I'm actually, um, so I'll, I'll speak on the bird excitement then in other projects, but I'm actually a part of the Chicago Audubon Society's uh, Bird Walk Leadership Program currently. Um, whereas Chicago Audubon Society's attempt to really shift um, the very hyper white, um, uh, wealthy birder culture in the city and trying to like bring people who are not that basically to to sort of like engage with birds. Um, and it's it's exciting because like I observe birds alone, but I think to do it with other people and sort of like see the ways that people are thinking through, oh, yay, cool, get me on the board. <laughs> How people are thinking through um, together is really wonderful. And we um, we focus on parks that are in communities where it's mostly black and brown people. So I, I uh, the leadership program, which actually was today, I do that at Washington Park. Um, and really it's, you know, a, if, if whoever's watched birds, I mean, everyone sort of has seen birds in some shape or form, but really it's just about like paying attention to the space. Really, that's really all it is. All the fancy gadgets help like locate details. Um, so what, what you're saying, Jen, really resonates in terms of thinking about how birds say like a larger story around history, around violence, around like our changing atmosphere. Um, actually, we took a class on thinking through how the reflective glass in Chicago, actually um, when birds are migrating, so Chicago is one of the main migrating um, uh, spots for birds in the US, which is really exciting, but because Chicago has all these wonderful buildings that are like really flashy with their glass, a lot of birds get, get um, that like really disorients them as they're like flying and sometimes they crash into it and get really hurt. And so like on Earth Day, which is on the 22nd, I think there was this campaign done to like turn off the lights after a certain time 
time downtown. That way, while birds are migrating during the spring, they can sort of just be led by the stars and the sky, which is normally what they're led by. So I just, sorry, that excited me so much that I wanted to talk a little bit about that. Um, and so sort of like pivot, uh, there's a, um, an, one thing that I'm really excited about right now, it's actually a collaborative project um, with, a, with an artist and friend, Jory Drew. We um, uh, curated this exhibition called An Epithet, um, which I could actually place in the chat. Um, the exhibition opened in March 13th. Um, it's an exhibition that opened at Co-Prosperity Sphere here in Chicago and Bridgeport. Um, it's it's an exhibition that's only during sundown. So like when it first opened, it opened at 6.30 and then it closed at eight. And now it sort of has moved because the sunset has become um, later and later. And really the, the show like, is a multi, it's a multimedia exhibition that includes five different artists um, who are like using playful strategies to make sense of, you know, our dominant, our, our, our structures that like are like state structures or, uh, or the way history is used to kind of bring about violence or erasure to certain communities. Um, and it's, it's a really exciting show because it's, it's, although I'm an artist, it's exciting to like, built something with another artist um, and also introduced people to maybe works that they haven't have had access to or maybe they don't know about of artists that are really exciting. All the artists um, have been in Chicago at some point, not all of them live here now. Um, and the show closes April 30th. And so the website that I put there on the um, chat is really cool because there's um, a homepage, a schedule of like events that are virtual. There's a catalog for folks who can't come to the exhibition, whether they live far away or there's like different reasons why not. You know, we are living in a pandemic, so we want to make sure people's safety is first in terms of health. And then there's also a reader, which is really like a compiled list of different links that um, can allow you to kind of, as, as you all mentioned, like invite you to the process of what helped us like um, conceptualize this show. And so the links are um, compiled of different articles, uh, different websites, books, and also like music links that can give you an idea of some of the things that Jory and I were thinking through when um, conceptualizing this. Um, and, uh, and you'll notice that like, sometimes when you make a calendar, um, like if you wanna schedule a, a, an appointment, um, this Saturday, I believe it's blocked off, but please come and see the show. Um, it's it's also weird to like <laughs> publicize something that is like that is happening, but this is like a part of it too, right? Like uh, to kind of let people know what's going on. But I think like curating is is exciting for me because this is the first time I've co-curated, but it's not the first time I've curated a show. I've curated a show a, a few years ago when I was a part of Queer Arts Collective, but it was with like four or five other people. So it feels like a different thing to do it with one other person. Um, and, I, and I think it's a, it, in many ways, it feels similar to art in that you're doing research, you're trying out different strategies and you're thinking of how things kind of can work together or how ideas can kind of bridge, so. That was great. <laughs> I love the bird connections going on here. Um, so I wanna get into some questions that uh, people have asked on like the little survey we had. Um, and so this one caught my eye because I think it'll help everybody. But so everyone starts somewhere as an artist, but what's like the hardest thing about becoming a rising artist or an, as, or an inspiring artist? And then what are some like important things to look out for while like starting your career? I would say that for me, I wish I had found mentorship earlier. So I would I would be on the lookout for a good mentor. And I think really it's about seeing who is out there and really saying like, okay, I think I wanna be that person <laughs> and then reaching out to them and and trying to form that relationship. And I think it's it sounds a lot scarier than it is. 
And I think you actually, like all of us have a lot more power and agency than we think we have. And also who wouldn't want to receive an email or, you know, a note or a call that says like, I think you're amazing and you're who I want to be in the future. I mean, everyone would be like, oh, wow, <laughs> me. <laughs> so I think, yeah, think about who you want to be and find, find people who can support you in that vision because I really do think back to uh, a lot of mistakes and wishing that I had a lot more guidance and knowledge that I know that someone could have provided me with, like especially being an educator and working in academia, there's just so much about that system that is intentionally opaque, you know? And I, I think that it would have been really helpful to have had someone who was, you know, years on in the system when I was starting out to be able to guide me. I think uh, something I would say in regards to that as well um, would be to um, don't get discouraged uh, when you see uh, other people uh, in the creative world. Um, I know that sounds very basic, but I know um, that's something that um, I have to constantly remind myself even now. Um, and, uh, you know, sometimes you can see uh, what others are doing and it may, it may discourage you. Um, I would even uh, advise you to, uh, uh, like Jen said, reach out to them and also uh, get to know, okay, how did you uh, come up with this project? Mm -hmm. Like what was your train of thought and um, develop a relationship in the, uh, in the world of the arts. Um, I know, you know, growing up, I didn't have too many people. Um, I didn't have mentorship, but I also, I also didn't have, you know, people who I could, uh, you know, connect to. I was always around guys who, you know, were more into sports or uh, just people who were, uh, you know, didn't consider themselves creatives. And so uh, when I got connected with Marwin in the sixth grade, that was like, that was just beautiful. And uh, as you can see, I never left. So, um, yeah, get connected with people. And um, like someone just said in the uh, in the chat, um, oh, Jen actually, uh, you know, don't be jealous, be friends. Uh, you know, we're all doing this together. Uh, I, I look at when I create work, um, sometimes I hope I, I did something wrong so I can have an excuse to uh, reach out to other artists and like, hey, this is something I, I'm, not, I'm not sure how to do. Do you know how to do this? Uh, do you, how would you maneuver this project? Uh, can I get some creative feedback or collab on a project? Um, looking at it like that is, uh, is a great healthy way to um, you know, move throughout the uh, space of creativity. So, yeah. Um, so just to maximize time, I'm gonna kind of go through these and hope like one or two people can answer. Um, but if you don't answer, like go ahead. So somebody asked um, if for advice who are just like getting into touch with like their creativity side um, after like getting that slump of feeling they're like not good enough. I don't know if you can hear us as well, but I think this was one of the questions that was that we were able to see prior to us starting um, that came in from the audience about um, how does one basically how does one experience not feeling good enough and then continuing in their art journey? Is that is that right? Okay, um, I'm happy to, I can jump in with this question. It's okay, <laughs> I can jump in with this question. Um, I think um, for me, and actually I'm almost gonna piggyback a little bit off of what Jen had to say as well, because I think that the two tied together very, very well. I think one of the most important things that one can do as an artist is to make the intentional decision to invest in oneself. And um, I say that, and oftentimes I'll, I explain to my students, there are two ways that you can opt to invest in yourself. The first is with time and the other is with money. So if you go the time route, it's just that it's going to, it will take you more time. You're going to have to experience things more organically. You're going to have to go through that school of hard knocks and have the trial and error. And there's beauty in that. Um, when you opt to go the money route, that's when, you know, perhaps you're paying tuition, you're joining a program, you're hiring a mentor, you're, you know, purchasing access to courses or books or whatever resources those may be. And in that capacity, you're also being fast-tracked, right? Um, because you're getting the experience secondhand and there's beauty in that. 
And there's a time and a place for both of those things. And depending on what your journey is and where it takes you, um, there, there will be times and places where both of those things will uh, make more sense to you depending on what your goals are. Now, as it relates to how to continue on your journey when you're feeling um, a lot of self-doubt or perhaps uh, feeling hyper self-critical and so forth, I would actually encourage you to lean in because art expands you. <laughs> there is, um, as an artist, you are literally creating something and placing it out into the world for the world to judge you. And specifically, if you're someone who has monetized your art, that is very much the case. And so while you're going to need to be expansive as a creative, um, to be expansive also requires you to be vulnerable. And with that vulnerability is going to come um, questions, there is going to be doubt, there's going to be a lot of um, hesitation around your own capacity and, you know, comparison with the others in your industry and so forth. And all of that's normal and that's fine. And that's also why having a good mentor is important. Um, because if you don't have that, it's very easy for us to get caught up in the, um, on like the mind trash that comes along with um, you know, just being self-critical. And if you get stuck in that cycle, it'll be hard for you to continue. Um, but if you have someone who can see you and can, who can hold space for you and believe in your capacity in those times that it's hard for you to do so, that is invaluable. Um, so to have a mentor, to have some, you know, some community inside of your uh, circle or to have that, that person in your corner to guide you not only in the tactical and the tangible aspects of your art and of your business, if that's the direction that you're going, but even in the very personal exploration of your experience as an artist, like it's one of the best investments that you can make. So that's what I would add. Yeah, I wanted to say one quick thing related to that. And even if you don't find a mentor to be able to give you that perspective, I think all of us as artists should remember that we should be the ones that set our standards of what success looks like. We should not be comparing ourselves to other artists, we should not be setting goals that are based on giving our power as artists away to other people that, well, if I don't get that show at the Guggenheim before I turn 50, then I might as well have never been an artist or something ridiculous, right? You really need to ask yourself, what does success look like for you? And to not, you know, not veer off course of that, you know, always remember that, you know, that is what is important for you and your work. And it doesn't have to be the standards that people tell us they have to be. And one more quick thing about self-worth as an artist and being you know, criticized and judged, I think for a lot of you attendees, probably thinking about applying to art schools and you might have that feeling when you apply to an art school and you get a rejection that that means that you're not good enough, your work's not good enough. You know, all that means is you're not the right fit for that school. And if they don't want you, you don't want to be there. So you just keep finding what's the right fit for you. I think it's really, it might turn so okay. I think it's a really great way to look at it. Um, but just the next question, is there something you'd wish you had done different in high school or your college life to help get you where you are today? Am I breaking up? Okay, sorry. <laughs> just wanted to make sure. Um, but just something you wish you had done differently. Um, and this kind of like goes along with that. But do you think that you need to go to a college or a university to be successful in the art world today? Obviously, it varies on the person, but just like your input regarding that question. I, I, I um, eagerly saw this as you send it to us and I immediately want to say, no, <laughs> you do not need to go to, to college or university to make it in the art world. But I do think that education and, and however one might define that does help um, sort of crack open windows or open doors and, and getting closer to to something, <laughs> whatever that something might be. But I, I think that like you can go to a, a four year art school um, for undergrad and then even go to the masters and still not necessarily uh, make it. So I think it goes back to this conversation that Jen brought up in Chelsea, this, this notion of like figuring out like what success means for you earlier on in the game, I feel like can allow you to have more time as Chelsea says, for then, for then for you to make sense of like how to make like 
what you need to do to sort of sustain yourself. Um, I will also add that in terms of mentors, sometimes it can feel um, kind of, uh, there could be a pressure to find one person, but I also like to think of it as like, mentors are also people who are thinking with you. So sometimes it's your peers who are reading similar things to you, or sometimes it's a really good friend who, you know, as Chelsea mentioned, like holds a lot of space for you. Like mentors don't always have to be the, the parameter of like a master student, like older person. It, it could really be like someone who's of your same age, who like um, is a rich, taker, who's a great listener, who is going to be honest with you, you know, all these things I think are really important in, in terms of thinking about how to create a sense of, of dynamic art experience for yourself. And so like, the last thing I would share, though, is one thing that I do wish that I would have done differently was to take more risk and to play and to play more rigorously in the beginning of my art making, to do it in such a way where I wasn't, I wasn't always so concerned about the critique or the ways that people were gonna judge what I was making, because I think that that got in my way of like, of like tackling large ideas um, because I was such, I was so fearful of like the, the rebuttal or like tapping into a quote unquote problematic way of making. But I say sometimes you sort of have to have to um, have to fail to make sense of how to even begin to value yourself or your own voice or what you care about. Yeah, I, I want to say that I think that that is really important to realize all the people that can be mentors and teachers and I'm about to drop a link in the chat to this book. I think it's called Collaborative Circles. And it's really fascinating. It looks at all of these great like artists, literary sort of leaders and how their friendships and relationships actually really helped shape the work that we think of as their individual genius. So it, community is really so important in, in creative practice. Um, and then I think this is a good closing question just to respect everyone's time. Um, but when is your day like day-to-day -day consists of being a full-time artist? Like, do you ever get burnt out? What do you do to motivate you? Do you step away from the work? So just how does that look? <laughs> I think um, for me, I would say that uh, I make schedules pretty much. Um, I have a whiteboard that uh, I have that I got from the thrift store. I got some markers and I've been using that uh, ever since my freshman year of college. Um, it just helps me stay organized. I do a lot of, uh, you know, uh, side projects as well as uh, freelance work. And then uh, I'm currently working at a middle school right, right now. So um, I have to be on top of things, but um, I would actually give some advice with this. Um, make sure you have your boundaries with work. I think that's something that um, unfortunately uh, wasn't taught to me in, in college. I had to uh, kind of, you know, learn that from a creative that I met in Chicago. And uh, he taught me all about setting those boundaries and being able to uh, know when to, uh, you know, close commissions, know when to um, set aside time for yourself. Uh, for example, right now, um, Sundays, that's, that's Jerry's day. Like, I, that's, that's for me. Um, I'm, I've gotten really into teas, uh, specifically the teas that have advice attached to it. I like to read them, write about them. Uh, I started journaling. I, for those of you who don't journal, try it. It's, 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 it's a new thing for me and I've been loving it and, uh, journaling, uh, take, going for walks, these basic things that require no money that just requires you to learn yourself and your connection to this world. Uh, doing that helps you hit the ground running refreshed. So uh, make sure you have time for that. And that's with anything uh, you do. Uh, whatever work you have done, you do now, just make sure you set aside time for yourself. Um, I'm very excited about this because I've been like doing this uh, recently. So if, you, if anybody has any questions about that, if you want to hit me on the side, I can definitely give you some advice because it was some of the best advice given to me. So. So my uh, <laughs> my day to day is wild. So I have a, I have a brick and mortar henna boutique, and then I also have this online brand where I have students all around the world. 
And then I also am a homeschooling mom of three kids, like pre-COVID homeschooler, right? And so I'm constantly on the go. And so being well-organized is 100% on my radar. Um, I work in Pomodoros and I use black scheduling and like I do those things to help myself to, to, to stay uh, effective in the, in the work that I'm doing. Um, but that's actually not even, those are not the tips that I would suggest to go in with first, right? The first thing that I would say is 100% tying to what Jerry has added is that boundaries are important. And if you don't have those boundaries in place, it is so easy for you to burn out. It is so easy for you to uh, lose your way. And it's very hard, I think, for us as creatives to lean into boundaries because it just comes to us. And so when inspiration hits, it's easy for us to lean in and just want to continue to work. Um, but we have to remember to create space for ourselves, especially Especially if um, we're, uh, you know, balancing both the art and also the monetized uh, side of that. Um, for me, what has been the biggest change inside of my own journey is when I decided to lean into my zone of genius. Um, this is a concept that's taught by Gay Hendricks in his book, The Big Leap. Very short read, recommended to everyone. Um, but he explains, um, you know, this concept of working inside of your zone of genius and identifying also for yourself where your zone of genius begins and where your zone of excellence ended, right? So you might do something particularly well and your zone of excellence is where like you you do, you, you um, execute the things well, people support you there. And oftentimes your community will actually wanna see you work inside of your zone of excellence. And the difference between the two is that inside of your zone of excellence, while you may be great at what you're doing, you're not fulfilled. And in your zone of genius, you're great at what you're, at what you're doing. And also it doesn't ever feel like work. And so uh, for me, leaning into my zone of genius and um, only saying yes to the things that, um, that allow me to occupy that space has been a game changer. Um, he uses the phrase, the enlightened no, uh, or saying no to anything that does not resonate with or keep you inside of your zone of genius. And I am using the enlightened no all over the place. Um, and it's one of the, my favorite, favorite things. And so um, if I could make a suggestion um, to, to any creative, um, that would be it. Practice boundaries with that enlightened no um, and, and feel okay with that too. Because whatever you, whenever you say no to one thing, it gives you space to say yes to something else. Um, and that's, for me, incredibly empowering. Connected to that idea of boundaries. Also, I just want to say, I just put a chat, a uh, quote in the chat that's basically the same thing you said, but in different words that I really love by Adrienne Marie Brown. And she says, your no makes the way for your yes. So really that enlightened no is uh, so integral. But in terms of boundaries and structures and how one lives their life, I want to share this quote by Annie Dillard, one of my favorite writers, and what she says is just so poignant. How we spend our days is, of course, how we spend our lives. What we do with this hour and that one is what we are doing. A schedule defends from chaos and whim. It is a net for catching days. It is a scaffolding on which a worker can stand and labor with both hands at sections of time. A schedule is a mock-up of reason and order, willed, faked, and so brought into being. It is a peace and a haven set into the wreck of time. It is a lifeboat on which you find yourself decades later, still living. Each day is the same. So you remember the series afterward as a blurred and powerful pattern. And so with that, I want to say that I want each of my days to hold pleasure, to hold satisfaction, to have parts of it feel completely meaningful and just like enriching. You know, I don't want to look back and feel like I spent all of my life in my inbox. <laughs> I wanna feel like it was really balanced and that there was love and friendship and there was rigor and great discussions and being in my garden and enjoying nature. Like all of those things should be a part of our daily lives as artists and as people in the world. And I hope that we can all find ways to make sure that that is what we do because that's all we have. <laughs> Uh, 
I mean, I don't have much to add because everyone just gave such juicy answers. But um, I really, I, I really love that quote, and I, I think like it's, it's, it's really figuring out in, in thinking about figuring out your own, um, the own way of like how you how you're making a way with yourself within like the arts or being an artist is also figuring out success is also figuring out how you define like how you want to spend your days and I feel like for me I think what helps me is like thinking that on one day I can be like super stuff with like a lot of things to do and on another day I actually have nothing on the schedule and that feels really great because then I can like play wildly <laughs> I can go on like really extended long walks I can decide to turn off my phone if that's something that I please so like there I, for me it's like all about the balance I find that like if I feel like I'm not grounded um on a on any particular day then I feel like I can't come as my full self to anything that I do, to my work, to my relationships, to strangers. And so like that has been like really important to me and that um, you mentioned Jarius, the uh, journaling actually like for years and years, I think that I um, ran away from journaling because it felt like I didn't wanna confront a certain kind of truth. And I think like last, I mean, I would take notes, but I never understood it as journaling. And I think last year I was like, actually enough of that. I need to change that. And I started to do this practice um, that is by Julia Cameron called Morning Pages. And I also did the artist way with all these um, different artists who are friends. And it was, it's an interesting practice because it's really like a stream of conscious writing that you do in the morning and you're not supposed to look back at the pages and her recipe is three pages. And that has been like a really helpful way for me, not only to like make sense of like early morning anxiety of productivity that we have from this like capital structure that we live in, but also to like come, come true to the page, like to see how I'm like, what I'm navigating what are the patterns? And I feel like that then does something that feels really useful for when I go into art making. So I don't, I don't always see like art making, journaling, this, I don't see those things are super separate for me. Like I think they all sort of have their own maybe file cabin in my head, but they all influence one another. Like I think, and I think through grounding is how I think that they kind of begin to kind of web each other or challenge one another. <laughs> Um, so it is over seven now, and I want to respect everybody's time. So thank you, everyone, for joining to talk in the panel today. I feel like I learned a lot, too. I'm going to take a lot of this with me <laughs> um, to college and all that. But thank you so much for coming, and I'll let Andy do any closing remarks. Thanks so much, everyone. All panelists, Esperanza, our facilitator, I'm deeply, deeply inspired. Um, that was absolutely fantastic and i will take all of the insights into my own life and practice as a creative person um i wanted to share with you all like if you can give us feedback on today's workshop conversation um i shared a link in the chat um please let us know your thoughts um and any you know questions you may have following up um and also uh Definitely also want to thank my thought partner in these events, Victoria Timbo, um, also staff at Marwin. I think um, this is our last event of our spring um, uh, pathways series. So it's been really wonderful to have everyone here. Um, yeah, uh, any last words that anyone wants to share? Also um, panelists, if you want to share any way for folks to reach out to you, um, you know, following up with, this event, uh, that would be great. Other than that, um, please, you're welcome to sign off and I hope you all, you know, take care of yourselves and stay safe um, and, you know, always do what you need to do. I just wanted to say what an inspiring conversation. Thank you all so much. I learned so much from just listening to you all. And I think it's really important for artists to come together and share their experiences with each other and, you know, drop their gems of wisdom because we all rise in community. We all get stronger in community. And so I really appreciate this space that you all held and just being so vulnerable and honest and sharing, you know, who you are with the community. So we, we thank you so much.